All right, Mr. Slemp, we are we are now live. So um, everyone out there, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Dave Gallagher, and this is John Slemp. Hey, John. Hi, honey. Hello. Um, this is going to be a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Uh, when it comes to one image workflow, I believe all the attendees have the ability to put their microphone on and ask questions compared to just asking questions and typing. You could do either or. Uh, I, I think there will be a lots of questions and lots of comments. So if you prefer to type them, I'll ask John the questions. Uh, if you prefer uh, to, to um, open up your mic, then, then please do so if you can. Let's see. We, this is a first, so bear with us on, on uh, how that, that will go. And so let me uh, quickly get into who we are as a company. And then after we get into who we are, we're going to go right into uh, John and introducing John in, in, in the bomber jacket. So give me two seconds. I've got to share my screen. Okay. And of course, it'd be nice to do it that way. Okay. So um, I, think, I think the majority uh, of, the cl of clients here know who we are uh, in capture integration. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time through this. We are uh, a company that's been around now. We're in our 16th year, uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Very small business, family owned, uh, with a very strong reputation in the high-end uh, digital of what we do. We also own uh, ShopFlow Studio pr production management software. And uh, our main part of our business is medium format. And um, a, a primary part of our business is it's what we're known for. Uh, and so those are the products that we sell. Now, who I am and who we are as a company is we strongly believe in quality. And this is not who we are when it comes to the race at the bottom. I think too many uh, companies and corporations and philosophies are how do we make things cheaper? How do we make things faster? How do we make them less expensive? Uh, we're first and foremost quality from the top down. Uh, and that's what we, what we want to stick with. We're not going to be part of this race to the bottom. And so that's who we are as a company. And I am not gonna go crazy and talk any more about that because you're not here to see me. You're here to see uh, and listen to Mr. Slap. So Mr. Slap, I'm gonna make you the presenter, okay? All right, John, you are now the presenter. Wonderful. Let's see if this technology is gonna work here for us. Um, hi. Um, first of all, before I get started, I want, I want to say thank you very much for, for attending each evening. And Friday evening is usually not the uh, prime time for uh, webinars and that sort of thing, but there is no real good time, so this is good as any. And I want to say thanks very much to Dave, too, uh, Dave and his whole staff. Um, they have been instrumental in this project, uh, unbeknownst to them. And that the camera that I bought from Dave in 2013 has been used to create all of these images. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the, the quality I think is fantastic. The only way it could be better is if it was a bigger, uh, you know, higher resolution back or a phase one, uh, uh, you know, fancy camera and that sort of thing. But uh, we've done pretty well with what we've got, I think. So my hat is off to Dave and his whole staff, and they've been kind to me in many, many ways uh, over the years. So thanks very much, Dave. It's very, um, very easy to be kind to you, Mr. Slump. It's kind of um, funny. Where we both wondered how we met, and neither one of us can remember how we met over 20 plus years ago. So, yeah, neither one of us know. Um, so I want to start off. Dave said he wanted to know a little bit about my background, so here we go. Um, this is my dad on the left here, and my granddad on the farm in southwestern Virginia sometime in the early 40s, uh, mid 40s. My dad went into the army in 1948, I believe. So I'm, I have Southern roots uh, in a roundabout way and uh, have always, you know, enjoyed living in the mountains and that sort of thing. And this is kind of close, but here's my dad as a young paratrooper, have no idea where, doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, when you're in the army, you go a lot of different places. Um, and here we are, uh, see, in 1964, we went to Okinawa. He was uh, in the Green Berets by that time. And of course, the Vietnam War was was on. And so here we are in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, actually in Fayetteville, just off post at our house, uh, me and my three brothers. 
and uh, I'm in the middle there holding Tim. Ah, sorry, uh, I got to get this mouse under control. Um, holding Tim, my little brother, who later went into the service himself and retired as a Green Beret Lieutenant Colonel. Um, let's see here. Come on, there's my dad on Okinawa being promoted to Sergeant Major, my mom, and again, my little brother. Um, you know, so I guess you could say military kind of runs deep in my family. Uh, here we are on Okinawa uh, in the mess hall and Thanksgiving. And uh, the whole hee haw game. <laughs> and as I remember, the, the chow was quite good, actually. Um, so, and here's a, a portrait of my dad that was done at Fort Bragg, actually, when we got back from Okinawa. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was a, I think it was a portrait and then it was turned into an old painting. Uh, he passed away on the 17th of November, or 17th of February this year, um, but he had a good long life, you know, was 90 years old, retired as a command sergeant major. That's what the little wreaths around the star mean. Um, and, uh, you know, raised four boys and served his country. And, uh, you know, I'm awful proud of him and I know my family is. Um, and here's my three brothers as adults. This was in 2009, I think. My brother Chris, standing next to me, passed away five years ago, but Danny and Tim are still going strong. Um, and uh, my mom is still going strong too, even though Tim called me earlier this week and said he was diagnosed with COVID, as well my mom was about, oh, five or six weeks ago, but she seems to be fine now, even though she's 86 years old. So after I graduated school, UTC, UT, uh, UT Chattanooga, uh, I went into the service and I went to airborne school at Fort Benning um, after my armor officer basic course. And then I went to ranger training, uh, which is also starts at Fort Benning. Uh, and then it goes to the mountains. This is at the mountain ranger camp in Dahlonega. That's my best friend, Ken Cockerham, who uh, we're still friends. He lives just outside of Nashville. Um, and uh, here's some shots from the mountain ranger camp. You, you learn how to do all kinds of stuff. You jump off cliffs. You jump out of airplanes if you're airborne qualified. You certainly learn how to uh, walk up and down, or walk is probably not the right term. Strive, struggle up and down mountains with about a 70 pound rucksack and uh, whatever else they can throw in there just for good measure. Um, here is on one of the cliffs there. It's about 90 feet. But once you get used to it, you go over the edge and you, you bounce up against the face a couple of times. And in two bounces, you can be on the ground if you know what you're doing. And it's actually kind of fun. Uh, here's the Florida phase, uh, small boat training, uh, and so on. These guys were actually at Fort Benning, um, uh, where I shot this, but that's very much what you do down in Florida. Uh, and then you graduate. And hey, John, so, yes. I want to say real quick, if, if anyone's having issues, uh, with looking and seeing us, please, uh, type in the uh, questions or, or hit your audio, uh, and raise, we'll raise a hand. Uh, if you're having any problems seeing us or seeing anything going on. Okay. Are you seeing everything okay, Dave? I can see it perfectly, John. I just okay. had one person send they're struggling. So if anyone okay. else is struggling, please let us know. Okay. Um, this is one of the images. This is probably the image that got me involved in photography. Uh, when I, uh, I did almost five years at Fort Knox, and then I was sent to West Germany and uh, I was in a tank battalion there. Tank battalion's about 600 guys, give or take. Um, at the time, I'm not sure what it is now. It may have changed again. Um, there were 54 tanks. In my first year, I was the battalion logistics officer, which means I, I handled the food, fuel, and the ammunition, uh, especially for when the unit was in the field. Uh, but then I became a company commander and I had 14 tanks, 62 guys, and this was my tank on a gunnery range. And I, I had purchased a, a Canon AE-1 program. I still remember that camera in January of 84, uh, right before I became a company commander in May of that year. And this was on one of the gunnery ranges and I just carried the thing with me everywhere. Um, and uh, really a snapshot more than anything. And uh, I entered it in the US Army Europe photo contest and um, let's see, I entered seven pictures, I think, in April of, uh, must have been 85. And because I, I mean, I was doing good to load film in the thing. I, you know, I, I knew nothing about 
uh, you know, getting good exposures with the meter and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but I knew I wanted to learn more. And so I wandered over, there was a lab on post run by a German photographer who was a, you know, civilian. And, um, and I just wanted to get some feedback. I had a few slides and he said, Hey, you ought to enter some of these in the U S army Europe photo contest. I'm like, okay. So filled out the paperwork as you know, it is the army. And I think I entered seven pictures and this was in mid April. And we went to the field for 45 days straight to shoot gunnery. And then we went to uh, maneuver training. And so I got off the train back at my concern in, I don't know, second or third of June and walked up the hill to my office late in the afternoon. And the young lad who was manning the phones and so on came running up with a message in his hand saying, sir, you need to call this woman right now. This is like 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm like, okay. So I threw my junk down. I mean, I was dog tired and uh, picked up the phone and called this woman who I'd never heard of. And I said, hi, you know, Captain Slump here. And she said, can you go to Heidelberg tomorrow night? And I'm like, what for? And she said, for the award ceremony. And I'm like, what for? Uh, she said, for the photo contest. And I'm like, and? She said, you want first place in the people category, color slides, can you go? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> so so I put on my uniform and, and they sent a van and Heidelberg was the US Army Europe headquarters. So the officers club there was quite nice. And um, wandered in there and got a medal and a $75 check and somebody from armed forces network stuck a camera in my face and you know asked me if it was good and i'm like yeah it was you know fun and uh, so i was hooked at that point the following year i won a first and a third and the following year after that i won another first and and i had and this was my first published image one of my guys was reading the army times and he came into the office and threw this down on my desk and said, is this your picture? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and apparently I didn't know it, but if you win at Europe, then you go to all army in DC. You know, nothing ever happened at that point, but uh, I was like, cool. So this was my first published picture. Um, and um, again, another picture shot on the firing range. And again, all I did was, I think I set it on F8 and I uh, opened the shutter and we could hear through the intercom on the radio, my tank was right behind this one, uh, when they were gonna fire. So I just opened up the shutter and rested it on top of the turret and waited for the, the flash literally to illuminate the film and there we go. And the squiggle you see at the end is after it's gone through the target and the, you know, the round is falling to the ground and so on, but um, that's an M60A3 tank firing there. So anyway, um, here I am, we're on a road march from Grafenbeer to Hohenfels to do maneuver training. And we just pulled off the side of the road, a little rest in the German countryside. This was not an uncommon sight at the time to see uh, armor units, well, military units in general, moving up and down the regular German roads. And this is a regular two lane road in Germ the German countryside. So they're very well maintained. You see the little white markers, every 50 meters, there was one of those. Unfortunately, there were times when we kind of crunched some of those, but um, couldn't be helped. Um, they were just plastic anyway, um, but you know, the government paid for it, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, it was, and unfortunately, and the reason they have these is because Germany could be quite foggy. And uh, so it was hard to see at night. And that's uh, also the reason why, you, even though, these are main battle tanks and we had our main ammunition uploaded all the time live you know go to war ammunition was in the tank uh, because we i was in the first brigade of the third armored division and it was the largest combat brigade outside the united states at the time and our mission was to go and basically occupy battle positions that were less than two miles from the border uh in case the russians got froggy um you can see the the yellow caution lights here we would turn those on at night just so the germans could see us because this is flat uh orange uh od green paint basically and it's it absorbed light pretty well so but unfortunately there were instances where people crashed into the back of tanks and so on um but we try to prevent that as much as possible so anyway um this is a soldier again i'm a hobbyist at the uh this is the russian tomb of the unknown for lack of another term it's, it's a different title but 
that's essentially what it was in East Berlin. And this is, and if you know anything about World War II history, there was no love lost between the Russians and the Germans, um, especially as the Germ as the Russians came westward into Germany. Um, there was some very brutal treatment. And um, so this is almost a slap in the face because this is an East German soldier guarding the Russian tomb of the unknown. But they were in charge, so that's what happened. Um, and uh, this is Ayers Kasern. This is the post where I was stationed uh, in Germany. My barracks, I think my company was here, parade field, our tanks were down in here somewhere in the motor pool. And we would literally roll out the gate here on alert. And one time we rolled all the way to the border and occupied our actual battle positions. Uh, usually we didn't go that far, but one time we did. So it was we were always on, on call basically. So I wanna play something for you here now to start the, uh, Hopefully it'll work. Let's see here. Ah, sorry. Um, let me see if I can get back to it. This is um ah, come on. All right. Pardon me for a second here. Let me see if I can get to it. All right. Ah. We're having technical difficulties. Bear with me here. It'll be worth it. We arrived at our air base. Uh, the base was called the Nettershaw, that's K with a K, and it was the home of the 388th Bomb Group. <clears throat> we arrived there at, at night and we were assigned to a barracks. We walked into the barracks. This was an enlisted men's barracks. There were six guys laying on their beds about 8 30 at night, and there were 24 empty beds. And we came in. Full of swagger, we're airmen, and somebody in our group said, "Where are the guys from the beds?" Oh, they were all shot down the last few days. What? You could hear our egos crashing to the ground. And I, in my diary, I wrote, "We unpacked in total silence." I, I play that for you because uh, having. It, uh, photograph these jackets. I also had the opportunity to meet some of the men involved <clears throat> and was fortunate enough to photograph them. Some of them we did audio interviews. Uh, Michael Schwartz is a friend of mine, a photographer here in Atlanta. He did three video interviews for me. I did one and I've got another one planned for sometime soon here. But uh, as you know, these guys are fading away pretty quickly. Uh, Larry Goldstein was a radio operator and a top turret gunner on a B 17. Uh, flew out of England. Uh, he lived in um, Hendersonville, North Carolina. Um, so this was the first jacket in the series. Uh, I belong to the Experimental Aircraft Association. I got involved in all this because I, in 2008, I started specializing in aviation. And I, I knew about these, but only in a casual, very casual way. And, um, and always thought they were cool, you know, and wanted to know more. And I thought it would be an interesting thing to photograph. So I put the word out through my local chapter and one of the chapter members had an uncle who had been involved in the war. And this was a jacket in a shadow box, you know, at their home. So he brought it to me and I photographed it. And I'm like, this is cool. You know, if they're all like this, this is gonna be fun. And uh, turns out A.B. Clement um, was a top turret gunner on a B-24 bomber in the Mediterranean, um, and uh, this is the, and this is one of the, and I should say, this is one of the things that really got hooked me on this, was you could see the sweat and the, the body oils and so on in the collar of the jacket, and that brought it home to me that this, you know, was owned and worn by a real guy, um, and one of the ways you can tell an authentic jacket is by looking at the label. Um, all the labels were this shape and size and so on, but they had different uh, manufacturers. There were about 18 different manufacturers, if I recall correctly, and um, size here. And the AN stands for Army Navy, and that was an inspector's stamp. Um, and the way the process worked at the time was the military would procure all the parts uh, of the jacket. They would procure the leather, 
they would procure um, the lining, which was silk initially, and then it went to cotton because silk needed was needed for other things. They procured the um, the uh, wool for the cuffs and the waistband and so on, uh, and they gave it all to the manufacturers. And so they produced jackets, and um, there is no exact number known. They were first approved for army use in 1931, so they were not new when World War II came around. Uh, but they had been produ produced in very limited quantities, sometimes even in the hundreds. I think in 36 or 37, there was like 800 produced. But as it became clear that the war was coming uh, in 40, late 40 and 41, they started um, issuing out contracts for many, many more thousands of jackets. And it was not uncommon to see 50,000 jackets, contracts awarded for 50,000 jackets to various manufacturers. Um, this is the guy's, this is his unit here, uh, unit crest, and this is the usual placement. Um, there was no standard. You could deviate from this. Sometimes the unit crest was over here on the left side. Sometimes they didn't have the unit crest at all. But this is an issue um, uh, name tape, uh, but it looks like it's just been, you know, inked in with a pen. Usually they, the letters were stamped in there. Uh, and the these are not fish. I had somebody say, you know, what are all the fish on there for? These are actually uh, symbols for bombs, and there's 50 on here. Uh, if you were in the Mediterranean theater, like Mr. Clement was, uh, they flew some pretty long distances on their missions, and if you flew more than 600 miles one way, you got credit for two missions. Um, early in the war, I don't know if I said this yet or not, but the casualty rate was around 70%. Uh, it was it was horrendous. The um, the Eighth Air Force was formed in January of '42, actually in Savannah, um, and then that spring, I think a contingent of about 15 officers and enlisted men went to England because they were assigned to fly out of England. Um, and let me show you the back of this here, and then we'll get more into that. So this is the back of the jacket, and this was really the only one that's had a naked woman on it. You know, you think they would all have, a, you know, some sort of risque artwork on them, but very few actually uh, that I photographed. I'm sure there's more out there, um, but the mores of the time when you came back to the States, you know, to Littleville, USA, you didn't wear this downtown on Main Street. You know, you stuck it under your bed and hope nobody found out, basically. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's why it survives. Um, here's the basic setup for the lighting. Um, the the, the um, foam core takes up the whole space now. That was just a sheet that I had at the time. But when I set up to shoot, the whole uh, bottom is, is white reflective foam core. And I painted the wooden sides white also so they would reflect light and not brown um, or whatever color that is. And um, blonde. And uh, there's two soft boxes on each side. 250 watt seconds, and uh, and there's a lip here, and I put a piece of plexiglass on top of the lip, and it's supported in the corners with uh, little triangles and weights and so on, so it doesn't fall over. But it's a pretty simple setup. The center support, you know, is hidden by the jacket, so that's not a big deal, uh, but it keeps the the uh, four by four plex from sagging. This is what it looks like when it's all set up. Um, I shoot tethered. See, here's the um, the Leaf Credo and the little phase one camera. Uh, shoot tether to my laptop. Um, I get up on the ladder and shoot over, you know, the, the phone core down onto the onto the jackets. Uh, there is another light here uh, with a beauty dish and a grid, and I put a little bit of diffusion inside that too. And I put that there, uh, you know, to talk about the lighting philosophy. I could have shot this with just soft boxes, but I wanted to show texture on the jackets because I thought that was important. Um, and also with the foam core on three sides, the, the light from the beauty dish bounces into it. So it almost acts like a soft box anyway. So I guess I get the best of both worlds, but that's how I decided to light it. And once I did the first one, I've kept it uniform for all of them. Um, and, and I did the portraits the same way uh, as far as the uniform lighting goes. Because you have to understand, <clears throat> these guys, once they got going on their bombing missions, this was a repetition. And the, the, the 
the army wasn't on the ground until D-Day in June 44. So the only way the Americans could take the war to the Nazis was through the air. And that started in the summer of 42 with 12 bombers flying out of England. And they all came back, you know, they weren't shot up with flak and they thought, oh, this is cool, this is gonna be easy. Well, it turned out to be anything but easy. And um, uh, there were more guys killed in the 8th Air Force than there were Marines in the entire war. And you think about that and some of the horrific fighting that the Marines did in the Pacific. And, and then you realize that, uh, you know, there were more guys killed in aircraft flying over Europe than the Marines in the entire war. It kind of brings it home just how hazardous this duty was. So the 8th Air Force flew out of England, the 15th flew out of Italy, the 9th and the 12th flew out of Libya and uh, Algiers. Um, and these guys literally flew all over Europe. And we'll get more into that later, but it was not, uh, there were a few missions that flew from England all the way to Russia. And then those guys refueled and rearmed and they bombed in the Balkans and flew down to North Africa rearmed and refueled and bombed over France and went back to England. So once they started getting shot down, there were Americans all over Europe uh, in some form or fashion. So this is how it looked coming straight out of the camera. And I've, I've used a, um, you know, the color control card, sorry, um, you know, for each one of the shots, just so I have a, a standard starting point but it occurred to me, and, and this summer I actually did some research, I tried to find out if there was a standardized color uh, palette for the, the unit crests. And the short answer is no. Uh, there is an Institute of Heraldry, uh, but I'm not quite sure, I was thinking about that a little while ago, I'm not quite sure when they started that has standard colors for a unit crest, but I believe at the time there wasn't any standardization. So this jacket was sent to me from uh, the son who in Oakland, California. I've had a few sent to me. And he sent this document along. This was a hand-drawn uh, depiction of the Unicrest that his dad did. And so this is the only indication of the colors that I have. So you can see um, the, um, the cross should have been white, uh, but as you can see, it's faded over time and um, it's become more or less yellow. And, uh, you know, and so it's like, okay, you know, I think this was supposed to be blue, blue. Um, so the hash marks are, yeah, dark blue, but they look more or less green in the finished uh, thing. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is his dad here with General Doolittle, uh, Jimmy Doolittle, led the famous bombing raid on Tokyo in April of 42. Um, uh, Eisen, uh, Roosevelt was very upset after, after uh, Pearl Harbor, as you might imagine, as well as everybody else in this country. And he wanted to strike back directly at the Japanese and he wanted to do it on their turf. And so discussions were had at the highest level of the military on how we can get there. And the idea was put forward to launch lightweight bombers from aircraft carriers that can fly to Japan and drop bombs, and then they would continue on to Russia and China. Well, that plan was set in motion, and they selected Doolittle, who was a lieutenant colonel at the time. He had been in the First World War. He got out. He worked for Shell Oil, but he was still involved with the military. He was a very famous air racer uh, in the 30s, won the Cleveland air races several times, I believe. Uh, he was the first guy to fly on instruments, uh, and um, he also had a doctorate in aeronautical aviation from MIT, and he got it in a year, so he was no dummy. Um, and um, so when the war started, he came back in as a lieutenant colonel, and they said, Jimmy, we got a job for you. And he started, uh, he took guys down to Eglin Air Force Base in North Florida, which is still there. And they painted an aircraft carrier on the runway, said, okay, this is how much real estate you got. And they started training. And all the guys, there were uh, 16 crews, if I remember, five guys each, so I believe it was 80 crewmen. Uh, and Doolittle was one of the pilots. And they learned how to take off in that short space. 
uh, and they stripped the bombers, you know, of anything that wasn't required for the mission. And they didn't carry real heavy bombs, nor a lot of them. Uh, and I, I thought they had just bombed Tokyo, but they actually bombed several targets in Japan and kept going. But anyways, after that was done, Doolittle crash landed in China, uh, as did most of the guys. One crew flew to Russia, and I think three ditched in the Pacific. Um, there, at the end, when it was all said and done, I believe four were killed, and the rest all got back. Doolittle got back. He went to the White House. Roosevelt presented him the Medal of Honor and promoted him from Lieutenant Colonel to Brigadier General. So he skipped Colonel altogether. And he became heavily involved in the leadership of the war. And at one point, he was the leader of the 8th Air Force. Uh, that's the jacket there. So this guy here, um, notice the date, June 6, 44, that, that's D-Day. Um, this jacket um, um, on the back, so you can see, so here's the front, you know, and we've got the yellow and the green here and so on. And that's the best I could do with the color. So Lieutenant Erickson, um, you know, uh, paint, uh, uh, stenciled his name inside the jacket. And again, this was not technically allowed, but you know, a lot of guys did it. Some of them put their service numbers in there. Some even put their, their unit, which again was not good because if they got shot down wearing the jacket, which they often didn't do, but if they did, then it could give you know intelligence information to the enemy. Um, <clears throat> but here's the back of the jacket, Lily of the Lamplight, and it comes from that song, Lily Marlene, which was a German poem actually, which was set to music in 1938, I believe. And it became, and Marlena Dietrich recorded that song. And she was in a USO show when Lieutenant Erickson was flying to Europe, they stopped in Greenland and they saw the show and the co-pilot's wife's name was Lily. So they decided to name their plane Lily of the Lamplight. And that's where that comes from. Each bomb again represents a mission. So uh, at that time it was 35 missions to get your go home card. I hope everyone's taking notes because there will be a quiz at the end of the night. <laughs> um, so this is one of the fellows that I photographed. As you can see, I set up on his porch. This is in Athens, Georgia. Um, he was a wonderful guy. Uh, he's passed away now, but he um, flew, I want to say 28 missions um, over the course of a year, because in part of that time, I didn't realize that until today, but I was looking at his, his mission log, um, and which they kept very meticulous records, actually. Um, and uh, at part of that time, he was an operations officer for his group. So that's why he didn't fly in a continuous block like a, like a lot of the guys did. But I set up the beauty dish over here. So basically it just rakes across the face. Uh, the flag here knocks some of the light down on their chest and so on, because I don't really, you know, I'm not concerned about that generally. This grid right here highlights, just adds a catch light to this side of their, their face and a little bit in the eye. And then the grid over here just gives me a rim light. And this was shot on the porch uh, or his carport, I should say. And um, sorry, getting ahead of myself here. This and those two people you saw talking to him, they had just gotten out of the car. They were friends of his, we were all going to lunch. And they just got out of the car, were walking up on the carport and he looked over at them and I popped off the trigger and it's become one of my favorite shots. And uh, he is wearing his original army uniform shirt. And that is the French Legion of Honor, uh, which if you, you know, flew over France, defended France in some form or fashion during the war, you were eligible for the medal. And it's the highest medal that the French bestow. Uh, and there are guys, I think he just got this uh, a couple of years before he passed away. So there are guys still getting them today. Uh, John? You, yes. I want to I state that the, the end years is one of the reasons we use go to meeting is the high resolution part of the of the oh. of the presentation. So I want to remind everyone, if you're not aware, you can pinch and zoom. You can scroll and zoom into these files and it has a lot more resolution. Well, oh, my, it has a lot more resolution transmitted than what you're seeing when it's full frame. So don't yeah. hesitate when you're going through these because some of the, I, I just love scrolling and looking at different parts of the jacket while you're talking about them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to make sure everyone's aware you can do that. 
Yeah, thank you for the reminder. Yeah, and here's so here's the metal down here, but you know, this is a 60 meg, you know, back on this camera, and it's not near the resolution of the 150, I'm sure. Uh, but I've blown these files up to I've had one exhibition and I've blown them up to 30 by 40 prints, and they are spectacular. They are not upresed at all, and they're 300 DPI files. Um, and and literally, I've had people walk in and they think it's the real jacket on the wall. Um, so this was one of the resulting portraits. This is his jacket. He actually was he had to ditch in the North Atlantic, just shy of England coming back because their plane was so shot up, it just wouldn't stay in the air anymore. So he and his crew, there were 11 guys in the plane at the time. Normally it was 10, I never did find out why it was another guy, but um, they all got out of the plane and then they floated around for 22 hours in a very stormy North Atlantic. Apparently two of the guys drowned because they couldn't get to the boats in time. Uh, and they were picked up by the Brits. The Brits actually, and the Germans too, for that matter, had boats that would go out and try and pick up the downed flyers. The Germans wanted to capture them. The Brits wanted to rescue them, you know. So uh, they did a wonderful job of that. And if you ditched at any time, you would get a little membership card that said you were a, a, a um, member of the Goldfish Club. Um, so there was a little bit of humor involved there. As you can see, his jacket has had some significant wear here. And the lining's been replaced. And sometimes the guys replace the linings, and it looks like the cuffs and the waistbands have been replaced too. Um, but this was, you know, this was the only one that I photographed that had this kind of funky green color to it. But from what I understand, there were jackets that were manufactured with this color. You can see his unit patch is pretty faded. Um, but sometimes the guys replace the linings just to. Um, heads their bets, so to speak. They thought that the Army wouldn't want them back if that was done. And some units had a tradition uh, where the fighter pilots, if they shot down five or more planes, they would become an ace and they would get the linings replaced with a red lining that denoted they were an ace. Um, there he is back in the day. He was a pretty handsome fellow. Um, and um, here he is as a 24 year old lieutenant colonel. After he finished, which is unheard of today, usually you have to have 16, 17 years of service nowadays to become a light colonel. Um, but um, after he finished his, his missions, his required number of missions as a bomber pilot, instead of going back home like most guys did in June of 44, July of 44, he stayed in England and he became the commander of a secret unit that was a, a scouting force. And the pilots were all ex-bomber pilots, but they flew P-51 fighter planes like you see in the background here. And they essentially scouted the target ahead of the large bomber formations. They would take off 10 or 15 minutes ahead of time, scout the target for uh, weather, you know, clouds, uh, and also defenses, see if there was any fighters around. And if it, was, if it looked okay, then they would tell the bomber groups to come on and they would bomb the target. And he did this until the end of the war and actually shot down two German fighters as a P-51 pilot. Um, he later, uh, after the war, flew for Pan Am for a while. This was his plane, which I thought was just cool, <laughs> very cool. Um, and um, that was the paint job on his plane. And uh, after the war, he flew for Pan Am for a few years. And then he went to medical school at Stanford and became a gynecologist and practiced until he was 83. Uh, while after the war, I think he was in some small German town and the mayor of the town came up to him and said, here, you want this? <laughs> we don't want it. We don't want this anymore. <laughs> so he gave him this Nazi flag and, and his wife still has it, um, which, you know, so we just hung it over the balcony at their house and shot it. But, uh, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. I'm not kidding you. Um, this is the Udvar Hazy uh, Center. This is an extension of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Uh, and it's just outside uh, of DC in Northern Virginia, right next, Dulles Airport is just off to the right here. Um, and it's there for reasons. Uh, this is a, a huge building. I mean, gigantic, you can't really tell here, but it extends probably for a couple hundred yards off to my left and another hundred yards off to the right and probably 100 yards deep. It is an enormous building. 
and um, they have the Enola Gay there. They have a Concorde there. Uh, just lots of aviation history. You can easily spend several days here. But um, uh, one of my clients is Women in Aviation International, and uh, several years ago, I forget exactly when, I had to photograph their board. Well, one of their board members uh, is Dorothy Cochran, who's a curator at the Smithsonian. And when I shot that first jacket, I just emailed it to her, said, hi, this is something I'm working on. Not really expecting anything. I just thought she'd like to know. 58 minutes later, I got a separate email from their curator of the aviation clothing collection. And he says, I think we have 15 jackets that'll work for your project. When can you be here? Obviously, I was stunned and thrilled at the same time, never expecting an invitation like that. And so I made my way to the Smithsonian. And this was, and so these are some of the jackets that we shot. Um, there is a an online uh, resource in England, um, which escapes me, but uh, what it's called, but you can basically put in an aircraft number if you know the serial number of the aircraft or the serial number of the flyer. Uh, you can search by name, you can search by aircraft name, that sort of thing. And if it's in their database and it's all volunteer, uh, you can look up the records. And um, so uh, one, one thing I want you to notice here before I get too far gone, notice the size on this jacket. 36. That's not that unusual. And a size 36 jacket then is not a size 36 jacket now. These airplanes look pretty big on the outside, but when you get into them, they were not big at all. And so uh, a lot, and that actually drove who became a, fi a pilot, fighter pilot or a bomber pilot. Most fighter pilots were pretty small guys uh, because the cockpits were just so tight. And um, the biggest jacket that I shot in this whole uh, campaign, if you will, is the size 48, and he was a P P38 pilot. Uh, but by and large, there were a lot of 36, 38s, and 40s that I photographed. Uh, this is chenille, as you can see here, and sometimes the unit crests were made out of this kind of material, which I thought was just beautiful. Um, and again, here's the stamped, um, as you can see, the stamped uh, name tape here. Uh, and a lot of times the, the unit crest would be over here on the left shoulder uh, and some sort of nickname or what have you. Um, and this is the back of the same jacket. And some of these jackets look pr absolutely pristine and some of them are just all beat up. And so... Uh, again, there's another bomb over here. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. This was 30 missions here for this guy. Um, uh, another one. And one thing I found out also is that a lot of these jackets um, are just donated. Here you go. Um, Sometimes, you know, and, and that surprised me dealing with these museums. Um, uh, I was counting it up today. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've dealt with at least eight museums or historical societies, and 80, 80 of the 135 jackets that I photographed were done in some sort of institution. But a lot of times they don't know anything about the jacket. It depends on who the curator was at the time, um, what kind of records they kept. Sometimes people walk in the front door, they lay it on the desk, you know, the reception desk and say, here you go, have at it, thanks, and walk out with no history, no nothing. Uh, and so it's been a little frustrating in that regard, trying to find out more about jackets. This this jacket here, for instance, these are four different aircraft names, and I found three of them, I think. So I don't know if this guy flew on all four aircraft or if, if he was a crew chief and maintained these aircraft. I just don't know. And I haven't been able to solve that little mystery. Um, but obviously, it's a B-17. Uh, the 100th bomb group was called the Century Bombers. Um, and Return Ticket was the name of this aircraft. And they had a reputation as a very hard luck group because they took some horrendous casualties early on. Um, um, so they're a pretty famous bomb group, actually. Um, and one of the other things that really fascinated me about these jackets. And again, um, let me back up here. You can see the almost red color in the uh, the waistband and the cuffs. And again, it just depended on the manufacturers 
um, the different the different colorings. Some of them are almost black. A lot of them are just dark brown, but some of them were really this beautiful russet red. Uh, so again, it just depended on the manufacturer. Um, so John, you've uh, shot 135 of them. Is that what you said? Uh huh. When when will you be done? Well, <laughs> um, soon I hope. My original goal was 50. I thought if I got 50 jackets, that would be you know the, the cat's meow. But you know, once I got started and the word got out, there's actually been a pretty good bit of publicity through various means. Um, people, you know, started referring me to, to, to you know, uh, uh, individuals. And once the Smithsonian said yes, a lot of museums, you know, I could call them up and say, well, I've shot at the Smithsonian. They're like, okay, well, you must be somebody, so come on down, you know. Although I have been turned down by the World War II Museum in New Orleans, a very nice turn down by their executive director. And, and and most of the museums that have said no, it's because of manpower. They just don't have the wherewithal to pull the jackets and devote a yeah. day. I can shoot them in a day or less, depending on numbers. There were only 13 at the Smithsonian, so we shot those in about three hours. And I never touched those jackets. Um, Would you uh, say they, there's thousands of these jackets out there? Um, my best estimate, um, and I had it written down here somewhere, there were about 750,000 jackets that were created. Um, I'd, I'd say it's probably in the thousands still that are out there, but who knows uh, where, where they are and what kind of shape they're in. That's another thing too. Most people uh, you know, think that if you take some leather salve and put on there that it's good for it, when in actuality it may not be. Right. Um, uh, this is a famous jacket here, a little short story on this one. Uh, this jacket was donated by the owner uh, who lived in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, he was a young crewman, uh, just arrived in England, and I'm sure some supply guy came along and said, hey, do you want a jacket? He's like, yeah, sure. So they gave him this jacket. Murder Inc. was already painted on the back of it. He had nothing to do with that. It wasn't even his plane. But he was wearing it. Uh, on a mission, I think he only got like three or four missions, and he was shot down wearing the jacket. He bailed out, and a German soldier had a camera and photographed the back of the jacket. Well, this photograph wound up on Hitler's desk, and he used it as propaganda to prove that the Americans were pulling hardened criminals out of prisons and training them as bomber crewmen and sending them to Germany to kill innocent women and children. It became a worldwide PR gaffe for the Americans. Wow. And afterwards, the word came down through military channels, fellows, fellows pay a little more attention to this, you know. And uh, so they were a little more censored after that, shall we say. Um, the German captain who interrogated him that night uh, through his broken English recommended that he scrape it off before he wound up in a POW camp. So he spent all night scraping that off with his thumbnail. And uh, he survived the war, got back to the States with the jacket, and his son painted it back on there. This story was written up in the local Charlotte newspaper, and a curator at the Smithsonian saw it and asked him, communicated with him, said, would you donate it to the museum? And he said, yeah. So that's how it wound up in the Smithsonian. Huh. And just, you know, again, one of those flukes. This is a pretty famous jacket here. Can, um, this is, can I ask a quick question, John? Sure, sure. I, one of the one of the attendees asked, and I, I also was wondering, in in the scenarios of the bombs, mm -hmm. you would think they were be painted at different times, at one after another, but a lot of them are very similar. They, they were they painted in groups afterwards. You know, uh, as best I can tell, um, yes, they were either painted afterwards or painted at one time. Um, I've, I've shot some jackets where it looks like the artwork was started and then it stopped. You know, it'll have flak bait at the top and maybe something down at the bottom and then there's a big field with nothing in it. And I have a feeling the guy rotated back to the States and, you know, never got it completed. Uh, I know of one jacket that was actually painted here in the States when the guy got back. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, your guess is as good as mine. But I, I have a feeling there were guys in the units that painted jackets, you know, that were artists before the war. Some Disney artists were drafted and pressed into service to paint nose art primarily, but 
uh, I'm sure they painted all kinds of stuff. You got to remember too, signs back then were usually wooden and sign painters was a, a profession. And so there were a lot of sign painters that went into the military and they wound up painting jackets. And then some were just artists and so on. Um, so there was a whole hodgepodge of people who painted these jackets. And also I've come to find out that guys in Italy, they took them off post and had local Italian artists paint them. I'm sure it happened in Africa. I'm sure it happened in China and India. Sure. Um, uh, you know, some of the unit crests were actually handmade in various uh, countries. Uh, and it happened in England too, I'm sure. And a lot of times it was for a carton of cigarettes or a six pack of beer, whatever. Um, sure. And by Just the way- Note, John, we are uh, a little bit over half the time. So okay. we're halfway through with time right now, okay? And you were concerned about if I had run out of stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> um, uh, and by the way, these jackets, when they came from the manufacturers, they cost about $8, eight and a quarter. And now uh, a jacket with a, uh, a good provenance, um, these days could go for three or 4,000, but uh, in uh, the eighties and nineties, for some reason, the Japanese became very enamored with original jackets. And I'm told they would pay uh, for a jacket in good shape with good artwork and that sort of thing and, and proven provenance uh, would pay upwards of $20,000 for a jacket. Wow. So, you know, it just depends, but this is a famous airplane. This airplane flak bait, uh, is actually in the Smithsonian, in the Udvar Hazi center, the actual aircraft and it's being restored. Um, he, the, one of the crewmen, this fellow here, I forget his name, but he saw the airplane in the Smithsonian and brought it to one of the curator's attention. That's my plane. And, uh, he said, you want my jacket? And we're like, yeah, sure. So they, he was the radio operator and they hung the jacket on the back of the radio operator seat for years, apparently. And then they decided maybe that wasn't a good idea because it, you know, the, the jacket starts to conform to the shape of the seat. And that's the same with hangers, um, you know, and things like that. So they took it off there and started preserving it. Uh, but as you can see, he flew 65 missions. This particular type of aircraft was more of an attack bomber uh, they did um, tactical bombing, you know, of road junctions and bridges and troop formations, things like that, as opposed to high level 30,000 feet B-17 type bombing. That's strategic bombing where they bombed factories um, and things like that. Um, so that's why there's 65 bombs on here. Um, but again, another fascinating story, uh, you know, and some of the jackets, again, uh, I don't know why, but some of the jackets have the cuffs ripped out, and I have a feeling it's because they might have worn gloves, but again, I haven't been able to confirm that. Uh, this jacket, before it was donated, they actually ran it through the washer, uh, which, you know, came from Arizona. So, uh, you know, <laughs> again, there's no guarantees here. Um, and I've tried to not, not be too over the top with the color. Um, you know, cause you could really saturate these a lot more, but I have a feeling that in, when these were new and you walked into a room with guys wearing these, it must've been spectacular. It must've been absolutely jaw dropping gorgeous to see all these different jackets. Um, this jacket here has been tainted, uh, treated with some sort of leather preservative as you can see. And so it, it as you can see, it clouds up and the, the curators were, were furiously trying to, <laughs> to wipe it off before I photographed it. But, you know, we got some of it, but again, you can see, you know, and so that's why they recommend you don't treat it with anything. You put it in a dark, you know, an acid-free box with acid-free tissue or what have you. Um, and you, you keep it in a climate controlled environment where it's not too humid or too dry um, and keep it out of the sun. And that's probably the best you can do with it. These were work jackets. These were not, you know, this, these jackets are, what are they, uh, 85 years old now? You know, they were meant to last a few months, <laughs> you know, or a few years. Um, but the Army decided to start phasing them out in 1943. Um, General Hap Arnold, he wanted something better because most times they were not worn on missions. This is a summer, the, the technical term, this is an A2 summer weight flight jacket. And uh, they were not worn. So most often... The guys didn't wear them on their missions because the bomber guys, they flew at 30,000 feet and these aircraft were open to the air. They were not pressurized. 
So they did everything they could to be warm. Um, and again, you can see here some of the leather preservative that's that's fogged up the, the leather and so on. Um, uh, but um, this is a famous jacket here. Um, this fellow was in the 390th Bomb Group. They're, they have their own museum out in Tucson, Arizona. And I went out there in March of 2018 and sh shot 32 jackets in one day that they had in their museum. Um, this is a, a famous jacket here. And a little story here, you may notice, sorry, the um, the little symbols. And, and this basically, these are walking billboards once you start looking at them and uh, can interpret the, the symbols. Um, this is a flower bag, and this is a little PW. And there's two stories there. The, the Dutch um, in late 44 decided to uh, destroy as many of the rail lines as they could so the Germans couldn't do resupply missions towards the coast, you know, after the Allies invaded in June. Um, and it really ticked off the Germans and the Germans instituted a nationwide food um, uh, ban, if you will, uh, where they started rationing food to the entire population in, in Holland. And um, as a result, about at least 18,000 people starved to death in Holland. Um, um, it, it was, you know, a bad time in Holland, shall we say. And towards the end of the war, the king of Holland was in England, and he pleaded with Churchill, can we do something, you know, to get some food, food to these people? Um, and so the Americans and the Brits struck a deal with the Germans, like in early May, the, the war ended, I think, on May 8th, 45, and um, in Europe anyway, and they struck a deal with the Germans, if you won't shoot at us, we won't shoot at you, but we're going to drop food to the Hollanders, and that's what they did, and they dropped hundreds of tons of food out of these bombers at low level, and uh, you can look it up, there's a Wikipedia page, uh, uh, the Americans called it, um, I think Operation Chowhound and the Brits called it Operation Mana. But uh, these bombers flew over Holland, dropped food by the ton in soccer fields and, and that sort of thing. And there are pictures, you know, of the Hollanders looking up literally with their hands in the air, manna from heaven. And it saved a lot of people. Um, and the PW, right when the war ended on the 8th, um, they started evacuating prisoners of wars from the prisoner of war camps all over Europe. And of course, the guys who were in bad shape went out first. Uh, and I think most of them were flown to a center in France, and then they flew on from there to either England or the States. Um, but apparently this fellow participated in one of those missions as well. So when you see that on a jacket, that's the story. And of course, these are aircraft that were shot down by his aircraft. Um, so there, uh, and the number of missions, so 5, 10, 15, 20, looks like 40 missions here. This fellow here became a Brigadier General later after the war. And this, this artwork has been reproduced numerous times. Um, and it was actually used, I, I licensed the pictures to a Japanese magazine this summer. But again, here's another jacket in the Smithsonian, no unit crest, no artwork, no nothing. Um, so this is a jacket that's made out of lambskin in Australia. And again, you come to find out they were made all over the world using the drawings, you know, that were approved. Um, you can see here, I think it says, yeah, it does, made in Australia. You can't see what size it is. Um, but again, the lining is kind of funky. Um, this one's, you know, and I think the uh, the goat skin, I believe this is made in goat skin. You can see it's torn here, and it had a pretty big tear on the back, too. Um, but, you know, again, it, it helps tell the story. This really was a worldwide conflict. Uh, another one, you know, and again, the bombs are on the front. This one, I just couldn't do anything with the artwork. It was just too far gone, and I couldn't bring it out at all. Um, this is from the China Burma India Theater. That's what this shield is here. Um, and this is from uh, one of the units there. I started to say flying tigers. It may have been the army flying tigers because there was a flying tiger, the American volunteer group 
was literally volunteers. Some of them were ex-Army and Navy pilots that were technically let go from the service. And they volunteered and went over with Claire Chenault. And they formed what was known as the Flying Tigers. It was a non-military unit that uh, went after the Japanese over China uh, before the Americans got involved in the war over there. And then at one point, the Flying Tigers ended and it became part of the Air Force, uh, 14th Air Force, I think, in China. And they flew um, from uh, in, all over China, but also as the war went on, there were units in India that resupplied the Chinese. We were buddies with the Chinese at the time. And they flew over the Himalayas and they called it flying the hump. And it was very hazardous because again, there were no modern navigation aids. More than one or two planes flew into the mountains. They were the, you know, they were the highest mountains in the world, uh, bad weather and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, the Chinese invaded China. I mean, the Japanese invaded China, I believe in 1937. So they had been in China a long time um, and fighting there. Um, this is a blood chit on the back of this jacket, C-H-I-T. That is a, a British word for ticket. And uh, this was a homemade in theater blood chit. And basically it says, I'm an American. I'm here fighting the Japanese. If you'll help me with food and water, you'll be rewarded at the end of the day. Um, and uh, so this is a jacket. This jacket was brought to me by the mother and uh, the daughter and granddaughter of a fellow from Iowa. They drove from Iowa to here in Atlanta, brought this jacket to me. They said they had other business here. I'm not so sure, but um, I was stunned that they were willing to do that. They didn't want to send it for obvious reasons. And she had a box of stuff too, and this was in the box. And when she pulled it out, I was I was thunderstruck at this, this picture here. This is in June of 44. It's written on the back of the, the image. And it's just drop dead gorgeous. And I counted up, there's 62 guys on one wing and I think 58 on the other. And it, on average, they're 150 pounds. It's nine tons on each wing. So this is a B-17 bomber, a G model, because it's got the chin turret here. Um, but there's guys inside the cupola here. Uh, you know, all over here, there's guys on the nose of the propellers, uh, on the spinners. And it must have been a pretty crappy day because A, they weren't flying that day and B, some of the guys in the picture here, if you look close, are actually wearing gloves. But uh, I just, I was stunned when she pulled this out. And um, and this fella was always talented with his hands and he carved these from broken pieces of bomber windshields, uh, hand carved all of these. And she pulled these out and I'm like, these are fantastic. So I photographed all of those and they were all in good shape too. There was one that had a, I believe this part here was broken off of the tail and I just photoshopped that, but all the rest were in pretty good shape, uh, you know, and they're, the scale is right. Uh, you know, I, I was just struck by the artistry of these plexiglass carvings. And apparently this fellow was very talented. And after the war, he built his own house for his family. He was already married and had a child and built his own house back in Iowa after the war. This is a gorgeous jacket. And again, this is a 15th Air Force out of, uh, Italy um, and uh, a close-up of the the green eyes I don't know if you can see the green eyes hopefully here uh, in the, the black cat there but this I thought this was spectacular and this was probably done in Italy this patch here would be my guess as is this one here these this was uh, 460th bomb group so uh, and one other thing too I should mention is that uh, you know, on most modern uniforms, well, dress uniforms, the insignia is metal. There were virtually no metal insignia worn on these jackets because they didn't want to get hung up either on a parachute harness or get punctured in case of a crash. So the insignia was virtually always cloth or uh, something similar to that. Um, and um, this is the back of the jacket. It was in a B-24 unit. Um, and I photographed his notebook. And I'll just, it's kind of hard to read, so I'll just read the uh, underlying part here. I flew with Major Davis in the rear position in Lead B group. They had different groups when they were in the air, you know, front and side and so on. Uh, and had the VHF command and intercom. The VHF and command is the radios. The intercom is the inter inter 
communication system in the aircraft, and number three turbo knocked out over the target. So he had no radio, had two vapor locks in number two engine, about 50 to 60 holes in the ship. My window knocked out back of my head, anticipated left tire flat. One thing led to another, left the runway on landing, buckled the left gear, skidded in 90 degrees with a ground loop and came to rest 50 yards off the runway, ship demolished. No one hurt. Leach had a bruised leg. Makes twice I've crash landed, that's enough. <laughs> so you could go out on a mission, survive the mission, your plane's all shot up and you crash and get killed when you're landing. There, there were instances over England where two, I know where two aircraft collided over the airfield because they it was cloudy and and both crews were killed i mean it, this was extremely hazardous duty um this is um paul crawford he lives here in atlanta still he's in a nursing home now but um he was a p-51 pilot in china um and was shot down on his 29th mission right near the end of the war and this is his jacket. And he was shot down flying a brand new P-51, which he said it was the best plane he ever flew. He was kind of ticked off <laughs> because of that. But uh, as you can see, the liner's been replaced. And he had a blood chip on the other side. And he said, whoever replaced the liner threw the blood chip away. Uh, I guess because it was in bad shape. I asked him, did you shoot him? And he said, I thought about it. Um, but this is his unit crest here, as you can see. Again, just spectacular. And, uh, and it was not unusual for, uh, they moved the blood shits inside the jackets later in the war and they would uh, make pockets and so on because these jackets didn't have pockets on the inside. And he had, he still has his, le his uh, silk map of China that was folded up in one of the pockets. Uh, that again was not unusual because silk was lightweight. So here's a blood shit inside a jacket. And basically I'll blow it up here, but it, Again, it says I'm a, I'm a friendly guy in all the languages that you might come across in uh, the Southeast uh, Asia, Laotian, Chinese, Korean, uh, French, Vietnamese, uh, Japanese, of course, whatever. Um, but it had to have the number. This number here was critical to getting a reward. No, no ticky, no laundry. So you had to have the number. And uh, these are still in use today. I've talked with guys who uh, have these, uh, have been issued these. And these are controlled uh, items, just like a weapon. It's serial number issued, so they, they would be issued in blocks of numbers to a unit, and then the unit would issue it out to an individual flyer. So if you knew the number, you knew who the guy was. Um, but these are in use today in Iraq and Afghanistan. Here's a portrait I did on a driveway in Athens, Georgia. This fellow was actually a Navy flyer, um, but I, I learned of him. He has an interesting story. He graduated Navy basic training on the 5th of December, 1941, two days before Pearl Harbor. And I'm sure he was on leave. He got called back and he said two weeks later, he had orders to go to flight school too, even though he was an enlisted man. Um, they had enlisted pilots at the time, which I didn't know. And um, he got back to uh, Jacksonville where he did basic training and two weeks later he was on a carrier going through the Panama Canal to the Pacific. He participated in the Battle of Midway and the Battle of Coral Sea. Uh, his ship was sunk, his best friend was killed and um, he was picked up. And as he got off the gangplank at Pearl Harbor, he was met by Admiral Nimitz. And the admiral says, how you doing, sailor? And he says, not too damn good, sir. You know, they sunk my ship. They killed my best friend. And I'm supposed to be in flight school. He said two months later, he was in flight school and he finished the war flying Corsairs. He participated in the Battle of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Um, and just quite the character, as you might imagine. And uh, as an aside, he went to a banquet um, years after the war where the Japanese uh, apparently ambassador or some Japanese officials were in attendance and a toast, a toast was made to him and he refused to stand, he refused to participate as did a general in the audience too. Uh, so there were some pretty hard feelings and I can understand why. Um, this fellow was in a nursing home up in Athens, Georgia. He flew 93 missions as a P-47 pilot. 
and after the war was the first licensed helicopter pilot in Georgia. Uh, he has passed away now. Um, this fellow is a, was an economics professor at University of Georgia. He was a B-17 pilot and was wounded in the back of the leg, the back of the, the thigh. It broke his femur. A piece of flat came up through the bo bottom of the aircraft, broke his leg, and he spent the rest of the war in a hospital. And after the war, he married a German woman. Um, didn't get the story on that one, though, but uh, this was also shot outside in the shade. Um, this is a pretty involved story here. Uh, I, to make a long story short, I, I shot this jacket in 2015 here in Atlanta. Uh, the, the owner's name was Walter Thomason, which is where I'm sure Uncle Tom's cabin comes from. And the following year, I was in Oshkosh at the largest air show in the country. A fellow I had met the day before, I ran into him again, started telling him about the project. And he said, oh, my dad was a bomber crewman. And he said, the pilot's name was Walter Thomason. I took it and I had shot this the week before I went to Oshkosh. I, I took out my iPad. I showed him the picture. I said, this Walter Thomason? And we got goosebumps for five minutes talking about it. This was his dad's jacket, which he brought to me the following year at Oshkosh and I shot it. But these are two jackets from the same crew. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that would happen. But as you can see, his dad wore a snot out of it. I mean, the cuffs have been replaced. It's torn here in a couple of places, but the artwork is essentially the same. Um, and um, so uh, Walter had this little souvenir, I guess. This is a, a box, a box at 45 pistol ammunition came in. But before each mission, he would pull a bomb tag off the, one of the bombs. It, it's a safety, essentially. There's a little propeller in the back of the bombs that as it dropped, the propeller would turn and at some point it would arm the bomb. But he would pull a bomb tag off before they left and he would write the mission number, the, the date, the target, and, and the bomb load. So they had 3,800 pound bombs. And he did this for each mission. His son wouldn't leave the box with me because immediately you've seen pictures of the bombs coming out in staggered formation underneath these bombers. And that immediately came into my head. And a year later, I became friends with his son because he lives here in town. And a year later, he brought the box back to me and I photographed the tags like this. Actually, this is three pictures put together. But if I have an exhibition at some point, I want to put them all just in staggered formation in one big long vertical panoramic but um just um uh and it's his diary essentially of, of his missions here i'll blow it up here for one of them um but uh we'll do the last one here this is september 28th magdeburg germany 12 500 pounds general purpose bombs september 28th so he finished on september 28th and he started on june 12th so basically, so June, July, August, September. So he had three months, three and a half months before he got his 34 missions. And that was not unusual. If the weather was good, these guys were flying and they flew a lot. And at the end of the war in late 44, 45, the Americans were putting up hundreds of bombers at a time. There were several missions where they flew a thousand bombers at one time with fighter escort to bomb Germany. And there is no doubt in my mind it shortened the war, and which was the intent. Um, but um, just an incredible, when you start thinking about it, you know, that's a thousand bombers times 10 men per, so that's 10,000 men just in the aircraft, not to mention the supply chain that's putting it all in the air, food, the fuel, the food, the, the bombs themselves, the, me the mechanics that maintain the aircraft, the spares, it was an enormous undertaking. Um, this is uh, Walter's, Walter's uh, Distinguished Flying Cross Air Medal. You get, for every five missions, you get an air medal. So these guys had air medals out the wazoo. And this is actually pieces of German flak that he picked up inside the aircraft. It was not unusual for it to come into the aircraft and just kind of rattle around. Um, but it was very dense and very sharp. Um, this is a beautiful jacket. The guy lived, the son brought this to me. His dad lived here in the Atlanta area. And um, he was shot down on his 21st mission over France, uh, which is why there's no entry. And uh, to make another long story short, 
he was wearing these when he was shot down. He was harbored by a German uh, French, I should say French farm family. And when his time was up there, he, he eventually evaded and escaped back to friendly lines and back to England. But he gave this bracelet to the French farm family as a thank you. And years later, after the war, he and his wife went back to the family, visited the family, and they gave the bracelet back to him. Um, just again, here he is wearing the jacket with his young son. Um, so uh, this this is a kind of a heartbreaking story here. Uh, how are we doing on time, Dave? Um, 13 minutes. Okay. Um, this was shot at the Minnesota uh, Historical Society, which is the State Museum in Minnesota. This, uh, there were women flyers in the war too. The first time uh, they weren't officially in the military, they were called WASP, Women Air Force Service Pilots. And uh, I've actually photographed 16 of them um, and may have an exhibition next spring out in Sweetwater, Texas. They have a museum there where they trained. But um, I wanted to include at least one WASP jacket. So I went to Minnesota. I was up at Oshkosh, drove the whatever it was, three or four hours across Wisconsin to uh, St. Paul and shot this jacket. And um, this is not an original A2. It's a replica or a, a knockoff, I should say, uh, because it, it's period authentic, but it's um, uh, not an authentic A2. Um, but um, this woman, um, uh, let me say here, um, uh, the wasp, flew for a couple of years and basically they flew aircraft from the factories to points of debarkation all over the country. They stayed in country here in the States. Um, so they never got in combat, but they towed targets. They trained pilots. They actually embarrassed some pilots uh, right near, uh, when the B-29 came along, which was the biggest bomber in the war and the one that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, there were some severe cooling problems with the engines and there were some fires and several planes were lost. Um, and as a consequence, a lot of the pilots in training were very hesitant to go fly them. Well, a couple of the WASPs were trained, uh, I forget, General LeMay, I believe it was, uh, got the idea to train a couple of the WASPs on the aircraft, which he did, which and they flew it beautifully, apparently. And he had them fly into an airfield one day and a formation of trainee pilots were, were there. And these two ladies got out and walked up and said, hi, General, how you doing? And everybody's looking around waiting for the male pilots to get out. Well, lo and behold, these were the pilots. So after that, there was no real problem with the boys jumping in the plane. And um, anyway, they were disbanded because of politics as the war wound down, so to speak. And there were a huge amount of pilots in the pipeline in 44, um, they decided to disband the WASP and they were officially disbanded, I believe the first week in December of 44. Well, a lot of the ladies, um, 20,000 had applied and they already had to be pilots just to apply. And um, if I remember correctly, 1,100 went through the same training as the men to become pilots and they flew every aircraft in the inventory, bombers, fighters, everything. Um, and, um, uh, so a lot of them, you know, they they really had the bug and they wanted to keep on flying. Well, this lady, Virginia Hope, she wanted to keep flying, too. So she took a job with the U.S. government flying aircraft uh, to uh, points where I believe they were going to be trashed. And she was on her way home after the 8th of December um, to her family. She had written a letter saying, uh, you know, I'll be home for Christmas. Well, while she was traveling to her new job, the DC-3 crashed on takeoff and all 17 or 18 people on board were killed, including her. Um, and her parents received the I'll be home for Christmas letter on the day she was killed. Um, so uh, the family donated the jacket. She was from Minnesota, so they, they donated the jacket. And this is Fifanella. This is the Disney design logo for the Wasps. Um, and um, Walt Disney actually did a lot of uh, design work for the military, uh, and I believe the this was done for free, um, if I remember correctly. Um, but you can see the the uh, tag is not the same as the other tags. 
Um, there are no snaps here. The, the shape is different on the collar. Um, and you can see where another patch had been applied already to this jacket and then had been taken off, which again was not that uncommon. Um, and you can see it's not a one piece. All the original A2s had one piece leather backs, uh, which is why they were such great canvases to paint on. This is two piece. So again, it shows it's easily seen as not an original A2. Um, this was a pretty cool jacket. This was brought to me from Dallas, Texas. Um, his dad was in a unit that had flat black painted B24s and they took out the bottom turret and basically made a manhole. And they flew at night over Europe and they dropped leaflets and supplies to the resistance and they dropped spies too. Uh, and so his dad's name was Starduster, which I thought was pretty cool. And he brought his dad's hat too. So I popped it in there and this has become one of my favorites also. Um, this fellow here lived way down in South Georgia, in Baxley, Georgia. He passed away last year, but um, he did 40 some odd missions and was shot down over Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge and was actually housed in the basement of a German army headquarters by the local friendlies. Uh, he had severe PTSD after the war and was in a hospital for over a year. And you could still tell he was hesitant to talk about it. Um, and he had a diary that he would not, he said his family had never seen it and he wouldn't, they wouldn't see it till after he passed. So I'm actually trying to get my hands on that so I can photograph it and bring some stories from that. But this is the jacket that was painted. It's kind of hard to see, but it says Lone Angel. But this is the jacket that was painted here in the States after the war. Um, and this fellow lived, lives up in Blue Ridge, Georgia. I believe he's still alive. Um, and this was shot in his garage. Uh, his wife's name was Virginia, so Jen for short. And uh, I did an interview with him and basically he said he had a good time at the war, no, no real worries. He said when they were flying their B-24 back to the States, one of the engines was leaking, or I guess one of the lines inside the aircraft was leaking fuel so bad that the guys were using their helmets to catch the fuel and they were dumping it out. And, but they didn't tell him because they didn't want to turn around and go back. They said, we're going back to the States. So they kept going, even though they were leaking fuel. Uh, and you know, it was just the way it was. Um, and you know, in, if you're in the military and you're around machines like that, you sort of get comfortable around it and you you figure out what, the, what you can get away with and what you can't. And uh, this was shot just this summer. I went up to the Indiana Military Museum. George Karen was the tail gunner on the Enola Gay which is the aircraft that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And uh, I photographed two jackets that were involved. Another, another fellow was on one of the other planes, a uh, reconnaissance plane. This is the Enola Gay, and this is the bomb here in the revetment. They're getting ready to back the plane up. You see the bomb bay doors are already open. Um, the military guards there, you can see he's wearing a pistol. They had shoot to kill orders, and it didn't matter if they were American or not. There were no Japanese on the island but security was as tight as it gets basically around these bombs. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the crew. And this is George Karen down here, little tiny guy. I think his jacket was a 34, I believe. And uh, he took the famous mushroom cloud picture because a, a lot of the other cameras on the other aircraft crapped out. Uh, and some of the film was ruined in development. This is Colonel Tibbetts here. And this is, um, uh, his navigator, Dutch Van Kirk, who actually lived just a few miles from me here in Stone Mountain until he passed several years ago. Um, uh, and the, the caption on the back and so on. Um, so, um, you know, and this uh, this was also on the same trip. This was over in uh, Missouri. This is an original Tuskegee Airmen's jacket. Uh, but it's not an original A2. Again, there were some things on the back that, that told me that, sorry, that it was not an original A2. We'll get there. Um, but uh, it was owned, and I'm still trying to get some original A2s. There's a museum in Detroit, and I think there might be one or two in D.C. So I'm still trying to get those. You had asked me if there were any others I wanted to get, Dave. I want to get some of these, and um, I think that'll round out the collection for now. <laughs> uh, people call me and you know here's another one they just sort of circle three or four minutes left 
Um, okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to open up the mics. Oh, everybody. sure. Please do. Yeah. And I'll just go through some of these. There's Here's the example uh, of the magazine use in this summer in Japan. There's a fellow there that does um, reproductions. And so these are the originals that I shot, and then these are the jackets. And I just noticed this evening, notice how, see the swastikas here? There's no swastikas here. And I have, in Germany, swastikas are illegal. You can't show them. So I'm wondering if that's the same in Japan and why he changed the symbol. That would be my guess. Uh, and here's a picture of food being dropped, sorry, over uh, Holland. You see right there, um, right here. Uh, questions, fire away, Dave. Okay, I'm unmuting everyone individually, individually so they'll be able to ask. Okay, and I'm just but gonna I'll keep go, on going through the rest of these here. Keep on going, and I'll, if they wanna type the questions, I'll read the questions as well. Remember, there's a slight delay. Uh, so I'm, I'm unmuting, but doesn't mean they'll know they're unmuting for a few seconds. So go ahead, John. Okay. Questions, please. Just keep on keep on going through the last slides that you have. Okay. Yeah, these are the last few here. These okay. were uh, shot at the 390th Bomb Group out in uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona. And that's a wonderful museum. I thought pound for pound, their collection was as good as any in the country, including the Smithsonian. They had some spectacular jackets. If, if nobody's gonna say anything, I would like to say, uh, this is beyond fascinating. This is a great uh, quest that you've laid out for yourself and executed superbly this is really um something to be extremely proud of personally and i think culturally this is a great contribution to uh to the sacrifices mm. that uh people made in defense of um, our country yeah yeah it, it's incredible um you know uh one of the, one of the guys i didn't show was a friend of mine he actually lived just a few miles from here he was a p-51 fighter pilot on d-day he flew 16 hours total on d-day over three different missions and he had to be helped from the plane at the end of the day because he couldn't get out um but when they took off uh, it gets light real early in europe in the summertime like at 4 30 4 4 30 uh, sometimes even earlier than that, and um, and they took off about 2:30 on that morning, and they were and from a big grass airfield where he was stationed, and they were not allowed to use lights, so they lined up four abreast and headed across the grass to take off. And on one of the first, I think one of the first uh, group or second group, the fellow on the far left got a little out of whack, and he ran into the tower that was under construction, was killed plane blew up, fire, and after that, everybody could see, and they all got off the ground. But 30 seconds into the mission on D-Day, they had a casualty. And yeah. it just, you know, it, it, it was just the way it was. The fatality rates are incomprehensible today. They're they, incredible. You, you, spoke you never, the hump. never, in your wildest dream, you put up with these. I went to Yunnan in China, which is where the Flying Tigers landed. Oh, okay. And uh, this is the Flying Tiger jacket, by the way. This is this was the only one that I the real. This was at the Smithsonian or uh, San Diego Air and Space Museum. The, the the Chinese are still talking about it. They'll still point out to you this is where they landed. We this is and I think the fatality rate was like sixty percent flying over the hump. Yeah, you I, knew I, when you were standing there, ready to take off that guy next to you might not be coming back yeah yeah that's that's why i played that little clip at the beginning because it was it was that way and because of that a lot of there were not a lot of close friendships uh developed um you know you you did your job and that sort of thing and 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 uh you know because literally yeah. you know the guy next to you could be gone tomorrow and and come to find out from uh i heard 
overheard a conversation at the Atlanta History Center a couple of years ago from an 8th Air Force veteran. He said if a guy didn't come back, virtually immediately, whoever was in his little hut, they were in these little Quonset huts, essentially, they call them missing huts. First thing they did was go to his footlocker and see if his A2 was in there and they liberated it, you know, somebody got it. Um, and, um, and also it was not unusual if a crew didn't come back, the supply people would pack up their stuff that day. And, you know, and, and, and so it would be an empty bed when the new guys came in. But um, it, it was, you know, it was brutal. It was brutal work. And, and um, you know, I, I saw a little poster, a John Lane poster today, actually, it said, you know, courage is, is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. And that's what these guys did, you know, because they knew that they were going to get shot at every single time they went up. Right. Well, John, we're, we've hit our time limit. I got to tell you, you are a wealth of knowledge and stories. I think it's a testament uh, that after 90 minutes, uh, only two people have left after 90 minutes. Right. Oh, wow. this because of um, listening to you is enthralling and all the history and all the all, all the stories that you remember. I can't believe you remember it all, but it shows your passion for what you do. So I can't thank, thank you enough for sharing this with us. Uh, for being a friend, for being a great customer and, and everything. I, I just thank you for your time today and thank you for your stories. Thank, thank you, Dave, very much. I appreciate the opportunity. It's, uh, it's been fun. Thanks. Well, thank we, you, John, and thank you, Dave. Thank you, Phil. John, when, when you're ready with a book, we'll, we'll let everybody know. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on that. I, I had a meeting last week with a lady who... Uh, thinks that she can help me get some funding uh, together that you know, we can do that. And, uh, right. You know, so I'm working on that too. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate it. All right, sir. You have a great weekend. Thank Take you care. very much. Thank, thank you. Take care. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night.